Imagine an orderly line of students waiting for flu shots. Suppose that the first student in line can get a shot. And suppose that if you are any student in the line, and the person immediately in front of you can get a shot, so can you. In other words, we don't run out of vaccine or whatever. Then we can correctly conclude that every student in line can get a shot. More generally, let S be any set of objects that can be arranged in order such that there is a smallest or first element and every element except possibly a last one has a unique successor. So, for example, our set of students is exactly such a set. There's a first element, and every student except the last has a unique successor. The natural numbers are also such a set. There's a smallest, first element, zero, and every element has a unique successor. By the way, we also get a set with both required properties if we start someplace other than zero. For example, we'll see that it's often useful to start with one. In other words, to use just the positive integers. Now suppose that we want to prove that some property P holds of every element in an ordered set such as students or natural numbers. For example, let S be students. Then P of X could be X can get a flu shot. Or let S be the positive integers. Then P could be a claim about the sum of the first n positive integers. Specifically, that the sum from 1 to n is n times n plus 1 over 2. How shall we go about proving claims of this sort? We've already argued informally that if the first student can get a shot and if it's true that whenever one student can get a shot so can the next student in line, then everyone can get a shot. We need to formalize that reasoning in a way that guarantees that we do it correctly. To do that, we'll define a new inference rule called the principle of mathematical induction. The rule we'll define applies specifically to the natural numbers, but it can easily be applied to any other set whose elements can be ordered with a first one, a second one, and so forth. Here's the rule. Let B, a natural number, be the base or starting case. It's usually 0 or 1, but it doesn't actually have to be. Then if P of B is true and for all natural numbers n greater than or equal to b, p of n implies p of n plus 1. Then, for all natural numbers n greater than or equal to b, p of n. Let's look at an example of applying this new rule. We'll prove the claim that the sum of the first n positive integers is n times n plus 1 over 2. To do this requires two steps. We must first prove that p in this case, the claim about the sum of the first n positive integers holds for the base or starting case. We're claiming that p holds for integers greater than or equal to 1, so our base case is 1. It's obvious that the sum from 1 to 1 is 1, but we need to check that the expression we've given does, in fact, evaluate to 1, and it does. Now we have to do what we'll call the induction step. We have to show that if p holds for any positive integer n, then it also holds for the next positive integer, namely n plus 1. In other words, we have to prove that p of n implies p of n plus 1. We've colored the values here to make it clear what we're doing. If p, our claim about the sum, is true for n, shown in red, then it must also be true when we replace n everywhere by n plus 1 shown in green. So how can we do that? We'll call the claim that p is true of n the induction hypothesis. We'll assume it, we'll reason with it, and then we'll use the conditionalization rule to conclude that p of n does imply p of n plus 1. Typically, in order to do that, we'll try to express p of n plus 1 in terms of p of n, and then we'll be able to exploit the induction hypothesis. The sum of the first n positive integers is the sum of the first n of them plus the last one. What do we know about the sum of the first n of them? Well, from the induction hypothesis, we know that it's n times n plus 1 over 2. So we rewrite it as that, and of course we still have to add in the n plus 1 term. Now we need to simplify this expression. And in particular, we have a goal. We need to show that it's equal to this. 
we notice that we need n plus 1 over 2 as a factor. So we'll rewrite the n plus 1 term by multiplying and dividing by 2. Now both terms have n plus 1 over 2 as a factor. We can combine them. We get n plus 1 times n plus 2, but in order to match our goal, we'll write n plus 2 as n plus 1 plus 1. The two expressions match. So we've shown that if we assume p of n, we can conclude p of n plus 1. Let's review our complete proof. We've proved the base case. Our claim is true for 1. And we've proved the induction step. So we have that our claim p is true of 1. The induction step tells us that it's therefore true of 2. And it's also true of 3. And it's true of 4, and so forth. The principle of mathematical induction has allowed us to conclude that, for any n greater than or equal to 1, the sum of the first n positive integers is n times n plus 1 over 2. Mathematical induction is a powerful tool for proving claims about the natural numbers. Here's just a short list of theorems we can use it to prove. But what about the students who want flu shots? Students aren't natural numbers. Ah, but their positions in line are. So, in fact, we can use mathematical induction to prove that everyone will stay healthy. We first show that student 1 can get a shot. Then we show that if student n can get a shot, so can student n plus 1. And then we can conclude that everyone in line can get a shot. We can use the same reasoning whenever we can order a set of objects and number them, starting with the first one. So, for example, if the top plate on the stack can blow away and Whenever the plate above you has blown away, you too can blow away. It has to be the case that all plates can blow away. By the way, don't get confused by our use of the term induction here. We need to make a clear distinction between our everyday notion of induction and mathematical induction as we've just defined it. Our everyday notion of induction is empirical. It's based on evidence. So, for example, we may have seen a lot of peacocks and observed that they all have multicolored feathers. So we conclude that all peacocks have multicolored feathers. This is a very useful kind of reasoning to do, and it enables us in this case, for example, to recognize peacocks from their feathers. But reasonable as this kind of reasoning is in our everyday world, it's not sound. It could be wrong. There could be, and there are, white peacocks. So. While we use the term induction for both of these kinds of reasoning, there's a very important difference between them. Empirical induction isn't sound. Mathematical induction is sound. If we start with premises that are true and we do a correct proof by mathematical induction, the conclusion must also be true, no exceptions.